Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Hollywood. I'm gonna go with Joe Hollywood this week. Oh, man. very nice, <laughs> very original. And I am joined by Imagine Os Pete. Hello, hello. And Andrew Walker, Walk Daddy twenty four. <laughs> Still wow. coming Walk at Daddy. you, Daddy. All right. Uh, I'm really excited about today's theme for our podcast. Uh, it's, it just fits right in with our Hollywood Crime Scene title uh i'm going to call this podcast blonde bombshells uh for some reason you know hollywood blondes uh have experienced uh, tragic fates and for some reason can't explain it and i'm sure it's just i don't know we're drawn to the hollywood blonde bombshell but uh we're going to focus on some of the tragedies that uh, have happened in the history of hollywood uh that revolved around uh, the hollywood uh Blonde bombshells. Uh, as I was researching this, I was reminded of a scene uh, from a movie. Tell me if you guys recognize this. I don't think Buddy Holly's much of a waiter. Maybe we should have sat him down in one row section. Which one? There's two Monroe's. No, there's not. That is Marilyn Monroe. That is Mamie Van Doren. And I don't see Jenny Mansfield. She must have a night off or something. <laughs> I love is that, that line. Is that Mr. Travolta? That is Mr. Yeah, Travolta. Right. Pulp Fiction. Great scene. Yes. And I think the point that that illustrates, at least that I can relate to, is when I was younger, they all seemed sort of the same to me. You're Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, uh, Mamie Van Doren, all of them. Uh, I. It wasn't until I got older where I started learning the individual stories of uh, each one of them. Right. And they all became separate and distinct. Uh, but the interesting thing, and, and you're going to see this as we talk about this today, there's lots of connections. Like each of these blonde bombshells in one way or another inspired other blonde bombshells. So they all sort of inspired each other and copied each other. Uh, it's almost like on a past podcast when we were talking about how uh, Chris Farley admired John Belushi so much that he ended up yeah. the same fate. And, and I got a lot of that uh, researching our, our blonde bombshells today. So um, the first one I'm going to get to, she uh, is sort of the poster child for the boulevard of broken dreams, the, the tragic ending for a young ingenue going out to Hollywood trying to make a name for herself. Uh, not succeeding and and making a tragic uh, meeting a tragic end, and her name is Peg Entwistle. You guys familiar with Peg Entwistle? Little, Just, only because you mentioned. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So born in 1908 in Wales, uh, the UK, uh, her family emigrated to the US, uh, ended up in New York, and Peg began her Broadway career at 17. Now, here's our first blonde bombshell connection with Peg on stage entertaining uh, and the audience. A young girl in the audience turned to her mother, I assume, and said, when I grow up, I want to be exactly like Peg Entwistle. Uh, that little girl grew up to be Betty Davis. Whoa. So Peg Entwistle inspired Betty Davis to become an actress, which wow. is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, she ended up marrying an actor named Robert Keith, uh, but divorced after finding out that he was previously married and never bothered to tell her. Ooh. And he had a young yeah, son. I just hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. He had a young son. His name was uh, actor Brian Keith. Now, I don't know if that name rings a bell. This is the beginning of our full circle thing. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, coincidence or not. But I'm going to be coming back to Brian Keith in a moment. We're rabbit holing here. I like it. <laughs> I know. I know. One thing leads to another, and there's just a whole. When, when I do the research on these things, there's a whole, a whole lot of holy crap moments. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, so after um, you know performing on Broadway in New York, of course she wanted to go out west to uh, make a name for herself in films. Unfortunately, she only appeared in one film that was released posthumously after her death, a 1932 film 
called 13 Women. Now, I, I don't know if this resulted in her death or what the deal is, but apparently her scene was whittled down and whittled down and whittled down until it just became virtually a cameo. Now, here's a cool surprise. I discovered that clip, and I am seeing it for the very first time today. Wow. Uh, this is the scene from 13 Women, the 1932 film. Here is Peg in and Twizzle's scene. Look who's here, sis. Why, Hazel Cousin. Hello, June. How you been, you old so and so? Peg is <laughs> Hazel. Oh, gosh, it's good to see you. Tell me, do you see any of the old crowd? You know, the dear old campus? No, I don't get around much. I've been taking a motor trip with a friend. And when I saw you were here, I simply had to come in and say hello. Thanks. Well, come on, step into it, honey. We're on next. I'll be right back. So, it's kind of sad for me because I've, I've been familiar with her story for a long time. I've seen the photos. Today is the first time I've seen a living, breathing person, and it was kind of emotional seeing that for the first time, right. uh, that she was a real person, not just some Hollywood fable that you, you read about. Hmm. Um, so, it, so it was kind of cool to see that for the first time today. So unfortunately, after shooting uh, 13 Women, uh, RKO failed to renew her contract. So she, she w had been staying with her uncle's home on Beachwood Drive, which is up near the Hollywood sign. And on the night of September 16th, 1932, uh, she left the house saying she was going to go meet up with some friends or something. Well, two days later, a hiker uh, walking near the Hollywood sign found a shoe, a jacket, and a purse. And when he looked in the contents of the purse, found a suicide note. <laughs> then looking down, the hiker saw Peg's body and contacted police. Uh, they presume that she climbed a workman's ladder behind the H in the Hollywood sign and leapt to her death. Uh, the note read, I'm afraid, I am a coward, and I am sorry for many things. If I had only done this long ago, I could have saved a lot of pain. She was only 24 years old. Mm. Now, the footnote to this is, according to Hollywood legend, of course, a letter arrived in the mail the day after her death from the Beverly Hills Playhouse, it was an offer to star in the lead role in a play about a woman driven to suicide. Good Lord. The Hollywood <laughs> ending. The tragic Hollywood Jeez. ending. I got goosebumps just saying that just now. Wow. So had she not leapt from the sign, she may or may not have gotten this offer to star in a play right. in Hollywood. But uh, let that be a lesson to you, kids. Uh, don't, don't ever uh, give up. Uh, uh, opportunity <laughs> might be right around the don't corner. Don't give up. Uh, 13 Women was released two months after her death, uh, widely panned, uh, pretty much regarded a pretty awful movie. Uh, coincidentally, we, I shouldn't say we just celebrated, but we just remembered uh, the 90th anniversary of her death hmm. uh, was on September 16th, 90 years ago. Uh, I had read somewhere that they had a screening of the movie. I think it was at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery where they show outdoor movies in the okay. cemetery. So they showed 13 women in her honor. Uh, and today, people claim to see Peg's ghost haunting the Hollywood sign. They smelled uh, gardenia perfume, which she wore, and saw a, a young blonde woman in 30s period clothing uh, haunting the Hollywood sign. Wow. So, um, now, getting back to Brian Keith. Uh, Brian Keith, who was... Uh, the son of the guy that she had married. Right, right. Uh, he yeah. was the star of Family Affair, which was a TV show with Buffy and Jody and Mrs. Beasley. Uh, he's w in one of my favorite films called Hooper with Burt Reynolds. Um, he died by self-inflicted uh, gunshot in 1997 at the age of 75, two months after the suicide of his daughter, Daisy. Oh. So lots of... Odd, eerie wow. connections there, coincidences um, that suicide played such a major role in this particular uh, family. So, mm -hmm. so she, like I said, became almost the poster child for uh, failure in Hollywood. Um, I don't think anyone else has ever uh, attempted to leap from the Hollywood sign that I'm aware of. Are, are you aware of I'm anything? not, but I was going to ask you, is that the first? 
I think it's no, the first no, no. and only. Uh, because it, I can understand the first because that was so, so long ago. Yeah. And, and those, the letters would have been right. fairly new, right? Well, it's still read Hollywood Land. So right. when she left, it was still the Hollywood Land sign. What year did those get put up? Originally, originally, twenty uh, mid twenties. I, I want to say the early twenties when it was just being marketed as a as a as real estate, like a place to right. move in and build your home. Uh, so I can understand the first, but only. Yeah, yeah, I think it is and the only ninety plus years. That's yeah, that's something else. Now right? I did read, and it's hard to verify this stuff, but I I did read. You know, the sign did become dilapidated when it was the Hollywood Land sign. Someone I read online said that the H had fallen over. Now, that may or may not be connected to the Peg and Twistle legend. <laughs> okay. uh, but eventually, they, they demolished the entire sign, okay. rebuilt it, leaving off uh, land. And, uh, and then that got dilapidated in the 70s. And then a bunch of celebrities came together and raised money and adopted each letter. Alice Cooper yep. uh, sponsored a letter on behalf of Groucho Marx. I think Hugh Hefner might have, might have sponsored a letter, and the Hollywood sign was restored and and rebuilt to its uh, former and glory. And some safety precautions that there did. are. You can't scurry up that hill and get close to the sign. Uh, okay. Authorities will be on you pretty quickly. So that that's a big reason I think why we may have right. never seen that again. But obviously, people yeah. have made it up there because they changed the Hollywood sign to Hollyweed. Yeah. <laughs> and when the when the Pope was in town, it was Hollywood and stuff like that. So people have had access to it, and I was able to go up to the top of the Hollywood sign. There's you can hike up there and look over L.A. over the top of the sign. So if you really are determined, not that I'm giving anyone any ideas here, uh-huh. if you're really determined, you can access that Hollywood Oh, sign. that'd be a great shot, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, yeah, over it's over pretty awesome. See the rest of L.A. down there, yeah. Yeah, and you can't, I mean, at least me, I, I can't help but think of Peg when I'm up there. Right. Um, and here's another weird coincidence. And again, this is totally meaningless. I, I may have brought it up on this show before. Um, but I remember walking down Hollywood Boulevard, I think it might have been 2005 or something. And uh, I walked past this restaurant on Hollywood Boulevard. I look up at it, and it's called The Pig in Whistle. Yeah, you were mentioning that. <laughs> and I immediately thought of Peg and Twistle. And I walked in, and I said, was this restaurant named after Peg and Twistle? And they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Apparently, there is no connection. But what are the odds of that? That the one and only person who leapt off the Hollywood sign to her death is named Peg and Twistle, and there's a restaurant. It, it, it used to be a restaurant uh, called the Pig and Whistle. That's a that's an amazing that's, coincidence to me. That's like fate. Is that really like a saying? Like somebody would come up with? Yeah, let's just call our well. I think it has Pig and Whistle. I think it has UK roots. I think okay. it's, it, it's the uh, like name of a pub in England that somehow made its way over. And I think there are uh, other Pig and Whistles throughout the United States. But uh, I just thought that was an eerie coincidence. And, <laughs> there are, there are a lot of eerie coincidences in all of our episodes. Like <laughs> sure. Cuz we're it's it the nature is. of our podcast. Also I'd like to point out kudos that we have a, an upgrade. We have audio clips and video now. Yes. <laughs> our hey, budget is going up. I'm trying like to this. bring production value to the <laughs> show. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next blonde bombshell. Uh oh, we're going to do this one. We're uh, Gene Harlow. Now, yes. Gene Harlow as as a fan of classic movies, you know, as a younger person, and and when I was a little older, I tried to get caught up on a lot of the classic movies that I hadn't seen. Uh, Gene Harlow was not on my radar, and it wasn't until later where I started learning more about her, and was surprised to find out that she was the one of the biggest stars in the history of motion pictures. It's yeah, like, she had a string from like thirty two to thirty six where she was almost like yeah had like a Will Smith run. Yeah, exactly. And the fans could not get enough of her. And I, I wondered, why wasn't she on my radar as a young person growing up with a love of movies? How come I didn't know who Gene Harlow was? And I bet you, if you ask the average person on the street, they might not be able to name a single movie from I, Gene I've Harlow. Only, I, honestly, I, I only know the name and that she was a, a star for a brief period of time. I, I can't give you any more IMDb details in that, but yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. you should cut yourself some slack, Joe. Yeah, you should be a little hard on yourself. <laughs> right. Well, allow me to educate you and our listeners, please. Uh, born Harlene Harlow Carpenter in 1911, we're going way back in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, she was married in 1927 when she had turned 16 years old. 
uh, to uh, a guy named Chuck who had turned 21 uh, and was uh, he was the heir to a huge fortune, which he got part of when he turned 21. Uh, so when they got married and he got a uh, part of his inheritance, they went out to LA and partied like there was no tomorrow. And both were known to be heavy, heavy drinkers. Uh, Jean had, uh, one of those stage mothers who wanted to have a hand in every aspect of her life and career. And her mother also named Jean, uh, pressed her into accepting acting roles when Jean really didn't have an interest in it. It's like, we're wealthy. We're having fun. Yeah, what could go wrong? Why would I want to go to work, you know? But her mom kept pushing her and pushing her, and she started taking jobs. And because of her, you know, platinum uh, hair and all that stuff, she started getting work. Uh, She started off as an extra in in 1928, signed with Hal Roach in 1928 uh, for $100 per week. Do you know who Hal Roach is? Produced the Little Rascals, there we go. Laurel and Hardy, some of the okay. all-time great comedies of the early talkie yeah, you got some, era. You got some Hall of Famers in there. So okay. here she was making a hundred dollars a week, which back then was, I'm sure, a ton of money. Yeah, I'd like to point out that, in some context, she's being forced to go work as acting. We're not she wasn't <laughs> asked to be a bricklayer or like yeah. thing. <laughs> roofing in july or something like that that's like right build, great you're going into say. the family business or at that point in la building a interstate uh cloverleaf interchange like yeah, in, uh, right roger right. rabbit right. <laughs> that's right um now here's a, a neat little footnote i just made a note of it here uh so you know Jean didn't really want to do this she was married to this guy she married young she went to hal roach and said uh this this acting thing is really taking a toll on our marriage, and I'm not really happy. What did Hal Roach do? Tore up her contract. Ugh. Said, you're free to go. And I was like, you don't hear things like that. Usually, you sign a contract. You stick to it. I'm but, waiting for the but. No, he <laughs> apparently, oh. Hal Roach was a, a good, decent guy and said, you want out? I'm ripping up your contract. Now, there's a Hollywood unicorn. Now, the but... <laughs> would be she divorced anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. So despite this goodwill gesture from Hell Roach, she ended up divorcing in 1929. And guess what? The effort Started counts. liking the acting thing and continued oh. acting. So late in 1929, uh, she signed with Howard Hughes, who had a thing for the ladies. Yeah. And uh, she, let's see, he, Howard Hughes was shooting reshoots for Hell's Angels because originally it was going to be a silent, he wanted to take advantage of these new talkies that were all the rage. And the actress who had been signed on to play uh, a role in Hell's Angels had an accent that did not work in the talkies. Uh, so someone introduced her, uh, introduced um, him to uh, Gene, and he was smitten, uh, put her in Hell's Angels, and it was a phenomenon. Talk about your overnight star. And I'm going to drop a name here that I'm going to get back to in a second. Uh, during the filming of Hell's Angels, she met an MGM executive named Paul Byrne. Does mm-hmm. that ring a bell? Mm-hmm. We're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, so she became an international star in Hell's Angels. Uh, audiences loved her. Critics hated her. Yeah. <laughs> they were not a fan. They, they knew why she was popular. She had... All the assets that Fair would enough. make a uh, bombshell <laughs> popular with the audience. Joe, I want to credit you because every time you ask these questions, you're greeted with like this vacant expression <laughs> here. So kudos to your patience. You're like, do you guys know? I'm like, every time Joe asks. Well, I expect the listeners to be, yeah. we go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. on. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. Yes, I'm, I'm with the audience. Please. So as she got um, more and more popular, she was signed to star in a movie, and I forget what the original name was, but they they changed the name of the film to Platinum Blonde because of the popularity of Jean Harlow and her platinum blonde uh, hairstyle. Uh, and we mentioned this on a, a previous uh, uh, podcast about uh, gangsters and mobsters. Uh, she was the godmother of Bugsy Siegel's daughter, Millicent, which I think is so... Odd. It's such a weird footnote. We just talked about that, dude. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. too long ago. So um, They were all buddy buddies. <laughs> yeah. Man, so so odd. Yeah. So uh, she did a ton of films, and uh, she during the making of a film called Red Dust, which I just watched for the first time, 
a month or so ago uh, with Clark Gable. A really good movie. Uh, her husband, Paul Byrne, the MGM executive I mentioned a, a moment ago, she had been married to him for two months when he was found dead in their Beverly Hills home. Now, the official ruling on this was suicide by gunshot. Wow. Here comes the big butt uh, that is disputed. And this is a topic we've touched on many, many times on this podcast. So they found a note uh, supposedly from Paul that read, Dearest dear, unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you and to wipe out my abject humiliation. I love you, Paul. You understand that last night was only a comedy. What does that lead you to believe? When when you hear that, what might have led to this suicide? To me, it sounds like he had trouble performing in the bedroom. That's <laughs> isn't that what you get from that? Yeah, Last night was only a comedy. Was it only a comedy? Yeah. That and his abject humiliation. Yeah, that's very possible. So, so that's what they're saying was his motivation for committing suicide. Wow, the threshold is really low over here. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to talk, uh, you know, light of the t- issue of uh, suicide, but come on. Yeah, yeah. Now that. That theory, even though that's kind of widely what what is agreed upon, is called in question by a lot of people. Uh, Gene initially was a suspect in his death, but that that got dismissed fairly quickly. Uh, I mean, there, when you're the godmother of a notorious gangster's daughter, <laughs> a godmother. I mean, come on. Yeah, how dare you accuse her of that? Uh, one theory is that he was killed by a former lover, and MGM came to the scene before the police did and staged the crime scene to look like a suicide. They were trying to protect their their bread and butter. Fixer. Yeah, fixer. This is, this is well, the fixer, fixer stuff. Like yeah. uh, Michael Cohen to Trump, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so she was in the middle of filming that, that movie, Red Dust, and they, they talked about recasting her, and the actress that they had approached to, to replace her was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to take that role. You finished the movie with Gene, which they did, and because the audience pitied her that she had experienced this horrific tragedy, it was a huge box office success. I mean, Clark Gable was in it too, right. but they thought, oh, I don't know if we want to associate all this scandal with this movie. Turned out it right. worked out in MGM's favor. Also, that I like the point of that it. suicide note. Is, is that how he always spoke? Because could you imagine, like, to whom it may concern? Like, yeah. dearest <laughs> dear, like, I don't feel like he wrote this. <laughs> right. Uh, also, dearest dear. I mean, is, is there any, like, suspicion about the note itself? Like, yeah. Did he? Yes. So one witness claims that he saw Irving Thalberg of MGM, MGM fame tampering with evidence so that it looked like suicide due to impotence. Uh, this is before the police got on scene. Uh, his name is, uh, he's a film producer, Samuel Marks. Uh, his theory is that Byrne was murdered by his abandoned common-law wife, Dorothy Millette, who then herself committed suicide by jumping off of a ship on the water. Twisted, sordid stuff, people. Yeah. Man, that is wild, wow. wild stuff. Um, so one, of the, one thing that I read, the motivation for MGM getting involved is they didn't want – their star, Jean Harlow, to look like her husband was cheating on her with somebody else. Oh, yeah. So that might have been the motivation to stage this suicide and write the note. And we have like to said, keep an up, a, a wholesome appearance. Yeah. yeah. we got to murder people. <laughs> Cover it up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so with that behind right. her, in 1934, she met and fell in love with one of my all-time favorite actors, William Powell. Uh, and she got so popular that when she starred in a movie called Libel, Libeled Lady with uh, William Powell, Myrna Loy of the Thin Man series, and Spencer Tracy, uh, Jean got top billing uh, over all those stars. That's how popular she was at the time. Wow. So then let's fast forward to May of 1937. She was filming a movie called Saratoga when she started to show signs of illness. People didn't know what to make, make of it. They thought maybe she just flu or maybe she's faking it i don't know um and so in june uh, she started showing signs of kidney failure uh she ended up 
Uh, she, they rushed her to the hospital. She slipped into a coma and died the next day. She was 26 years old. Think about what she accomplished before turning 30 or 26. That, that yeah. blows my mind wow. to be one of the biggest stars in the world, uh, and you didn't even reach your 30s. Now, some blame uh, her mother, her stage mother that we mentioned earlier, because she was a Christian scientist, and when Jean was a child growing up, she re- refused any sort of medical treatment. Uh, God, uh, it's God's will. God will heal you if that's what's meant to be. So she did may she ever, have been weakened ha- by that. Did she ever have a history of scarlet fever or anything like that? I, I don't know, but she she had had ailments younger that may have played a role in okay. weakening her yeah. system. And uh, her mom refused treatment. Now, with this kidney failure thing, they said that doctors came to her side and stuff, but apparently they didn't act. And I don't even know if they recognized what was going on. Um, But, again, uh, the the studio was faced with the dilemma of of reshooting Saratoga. Uh, They decided to uh, finish it using doubles where they can get away with doubles. It was released in June of 1937 uh, after her death and was Jean Harlow's highest-grossing film of her career. Hmm. Pretty wow. wild stuff. Man. Yeah. yeah. Pretty crazy. Uh, she She's in a mausoleum. I forget what the cemetery is, but she's in a crypt that it doesn't— you can't gain access to it as a member of the public. You need to be a family member to gain access to it. Um, but she was buried in a dress that she wore in Libeled Lady. And, um, yeah, she was— Big, big star at the top of her game, and then gone like that. There, um, there, there's a picture here on Wikipedia of her, her crypt for the audience oh, out there wow. at, at oh, Forest, wow. La- Forest Lawn. Forest Lawn, okay. Yeah. Another um, famous cemetery there. Speaking yeah. of which, I'm going to play a little clip from Libeled Lady, which I absolutely love. It's a great movie. Uh, I want you guys to hear her voice. She, she kind of has this no-nonsense rough thing now like i I said she's she was from what kansas kansas Kansas? city missouri Mm -hmm. she has this very unique accent and you got to wonder if it's something she created for the movies you can't do this to me warren haggerty not to me let me out of here for two years you've had me on a merry-go-round waiting for that gold ring but this is where i get off and stay off i won't be quiet the things I've taken for that newspaper, Warren Haggerty, but this gets the blue ribbon trying to marry me off to that, to that bad bone. Sir, let's not deal in personalities. <laughs> That's William Powell. <laughs> um, so it's a very distinct accent, and I don't know, maybe it's a Missourian accent. I don't know. But there is, are you guys familiar with the, uh, I think they called it the mid-Atlantic accent? Yes. A lot of actors and uh, actresses it. spoke with this air of, I don't know, royalty or something. And it was an accent that really didn't exist in the real world. It was done specifically for film and theater. And, and a good chunk of America now speaks that way because, <laughs> in my, from what I've read, because it was promoted in radio and television. Yes. And if you take any journalism classes, uh, you get taught, uh, you know, as an on-air personality to speak still in that type of accent. That's yeah. why you can go down to Atlanta and people who who've lived there for 20 years will s- still speak in the same way as someone from Detroit. Yeah. Uh, on local news and yeah. So, Oh, wait a minute. I, wait, I feel like that has shaped when you say mid Atlantic. Are you, oh, I'm thinking about the ones where they did those old time news and was like Dateline. Yeah. Yeah. It, to, no, no, that's exactly it. The like, boys are fighting the Nazis right of, now. And it's, but it's, yeah. it, I think it's morphed into Tom Brokaw on NBC. Oh, okay. Nightly gotcha, news. gotcha. Like there's, there's still a certain standard, uh, within, uh, elite journalism circles uh, yeah like this is how you talk on air you you mm-hmm. want you want a, an accent that isn't going to pigeonhole you to a certain region so they developed this accent that right. could be from anywhere neutral and when yeah. i think mid-atlantic accent i think Catherine hepburn she yeah. had that voice uh oh by the, you know that sort of thing and it's like where's that from what what region and it, it was created specifically for the film and theater industry and like you said yes grew in popularity where people tried to emulate it to kind of rise above the the peasants so to speak right i, I mean it's the same way of how a lot of gotta watch my language but a, a <laughs> lot of uh 
women who uh, like Kim Kardashian like talking in that kind of baby voice. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and it's, it's and maybe it's just me, but the last like what fifteen years I've seen a lot of a lot of people in real life like is that is that your real voice? <laughs> anyway, oh yeah, I'd be like, but it's people in in places of power uh, and influence, influence, yeah, yeah, uh, influencing the rest of us. So. We yeah. now we now go back to the gentlemen of HCS as they go down for the blonde bombshells. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The new. You know the the Hindenburg uh, comes in over New Jersey like they have this this voice and Jean Harlow sounds like that maybe someone tried to teach her that, but there's a little bit of like this Brooklyn or Bronx influence yeah. in her and so she comes across as no nonsense kind of I take no guff from anybody sort yeah. of a voice and she, that was part of her appeal right yeah I mean probably in person like she probably wasn't like a pushover yeah and yeah. and that came out subtly in her voice and characters yeah 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 now one thing that did drive me crazy about Jean Harlow is uh in some of her earliest photographs she had very lovely eyebrows um, but for some reason she started shaving them off and penciling them in and yeah, it looks like a roller coaster. Yeah, and at one <laughs> point, I think they stopped growing back, so she was forced to draw them in, and they're all over the place. They are. They yeah. do not look like <laughs> I natural know, eyebrows. I don't know if you've ever seen anything. They've probably gotten better now. When they used to run, when they sweat. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> the you know, like, the oh. eyebrows would come you know, like That doesn't seem but right. But that was one little thing about Jean that yeah. uh, drove me crazy. But when I did finally start watching her movies, I understood. I, I got the appeal. And right. like I said, the critics weren't fans early on, and you can kind of see why. But as she matured as an actress, she she got better and better and better. And it's a shame uh, that she died so young because you just wonder what, what was next. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, moving on to our next blonde bombshell, uh, Jane Mansfield, uh, who, again, you know, tried to capitalize on the, the, the blonde bombshell uh, craze. And uh, and she had the proportions uh, to draw attention to herself. As a matter of fact, she she orchestrated a lot of stunts where, oops, uh, my top slipped down sort of a thing. Uh. And that made her a star uh, right or wrong. Uh, she was born Vera Jane Palmer in 1933, Pennsylvania. Took the name Mansfield from first husband Paul Mansfield. Went blonde in 1954 while auditioning for parts. And uh, posed for Playboy several times in the 50s. And uh, back then, you know, you think that would be scandalous. But Marilyn did this, a similar thing. Yeah. And it did not, it, as a matter of fact, it intrigued people to, yeah. to oh, what's this all about? Uh, she starred in a film called Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter, 1957, The Girl Can't Help It, 1956, and in a movie called Promises, Promises in 1963, she was the first major American actress to perform nude in a modern film. Now, in the pre-code days, you might occasionally catch uh, Clara Bow or somebody might have a little slip, wardrobe malfunction. Uh, but then the censors came out and put a stop to that. Uh, so she was, uh, Jane Mansfield was the first modern American actress to perform nude in a, in a film. Uh, in 1967, she was in Biloxi, Mississippi to perform at a supper club. And on June 29th, uh, she was in a car with Sam Brody, who was her attorney and companion. Uh, their driver, Ronnie Harrison, who was something like 20 or 21 years old, and her three children were asleep in the back of the car at about 2.25 uh, a.m. Uh, they were cruising along on this road. A truck that w- was up ahead had been spraying for mosquitoes, so the area was kind of foggy because of the mosquito spray. And as they sort of came around uh, this corner, this semi-truck had stopped because of the mosquito spraying, and they slammed right into the back of the truck at full speed. Didn't oh, even geez. didn't even hit the brakes. Wow. Uh, all three adults who were sitting in the front seat all died on impact. Uh, the children survived, including a young girl 
Uh, I think she went by the name uh, Mari or Mary at the time, but her real name is Mariska Hargitay, who is a famous actress today. Yeah. She was one Law of the order. children. Yeah. Yep. She was one of the children in the back seat of this car. I've oh, never wow. heard that. Did I, not that's know why that. I'm here. That's Joe. why Joe. I'm here <laughs> to educate you. So wow. think about that. Mariska Hargitay was in the back seat of the car. Uh, the three children survived with uh, minor injuries, but all three adults. I uh, went right into the back of that truck. And there's a movie, there's another little footnote, there's a movie that has one of the greatest car chases of all time called The Seven Ups. It stars Roy Scheider, uh, who uh, was in Jaws. Right. He's chasing a bad guy. Uh, he, as he turns a corner or whatever, there's a truck there. He slams into the back of this truck. And they said that was a deliberate um, homage to the Jane Mansfield accident. It's exactly how it happened uh, wow. to Jane oh, Mansfield. Wow. I was just going to say, just going over a couple of her pictures, like you can see that Mariska Hargitay is, is her yeah. Yeah. is her daughter, like definitely in the face. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure every the Law and Order diehards would be like, you can, you did, guys didn't know that? You guys didn't know that until <laughs> like, 2022. <yeah. laughs> Sorry, Sorry, guys. Never seen an episode of... Long yeah. in my life. <laughs> uh, the top of the car was sheared off like a tuna can. Uh, she was only 34 years old. Uh, again, I just learned something new uh, as I was doing research for this. Uh, the car was on display at the Dearly Departed Tours and Artifact Museum in L.A., right across the street from the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. That's... I did not know that. I'm shocked to learn that That's now. That's a little morbid. Uh, and and that's what they're known for. They have weird little artifacts that Kinda are connected to borderline exploitative. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But they purchased the car and displayed it. Uh, it was there until COVID, and then the museum shut down, and I guess it has since closed permanently. Wow. But behold, the car that Bonnie and Clyde got ventilated in. I've seen that car. That was oh, on wow. display at the Ronald Reagan Museum of all places. Hey, let's let's get those cars at, at uh, Henry Ford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, it, that would. I need to I'm, find. I need to justify a reason to go for the first time. So. I'm like, they preserved that car. I said that yeah. in jest, but now Joe's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, now I've seen him. Now, like, what? It's normally on display at a casino in Nevada, and they must have loaned it to an FBI, a traveling FBI exhibit that was on display at the Ronald Reagan Museum in California, and. I went there, saw the car with the bullet holes and everything. I had always wanted to see the car. I know it's morbid, but I had always wanted to see it. Finally got to see it up close. And this is a complete coincidence. But just weeks later, I went to Las Vegas with family, discovered a car museum that I did not know existed, went in to look around, and to my surprise, found the Bonnie and Clyde car from the film Bonnie and Clyde with, uh, with uh, Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty. So within the span of like a couple of weeks, I saw the historic Bonnie and Clyde car in the movie Bonnie and Clyde car. Cool. That blows my mind. That's <laughs> weird. That's like manifestation right there. <laughs> Joe's bringing the coincidences with him. It's odd. <laughs> the universe works in mysterious ways. This, this is a um, simulation. <laughs> <laughs> now before um, before I we move on to our next blonde bombshell. I want to play a little clip here, and this is another little minor coincidence. There's an actor named Tom Ewell, and uh, his biggest film is with the next Blonde Bombshell we're going to talk about, uh, The Seven Year Itch. Um, but he was also in a film with Jane Mansfield. So think about this. This this schlub, who's just sort of an average-looking you know guy, kissed Marilyn Monroe and James Manfield, Jane, Jane, <laughs> Jane Mansfield. Uh, here's a little clip from The Girl Can't Help It. That seven-year itch fellow, Tom Yule. Seven million times itchier than before. <laughs> oh, I've been in men's bedrooms before. That's Jane. And man, oh man, oh Mansfield. Jane Mansfield, that is. The terrific star of Rock Hunter in her first rocking role on the screen. But everyone figures me for a sex part. No one thinks I'm equipped for motherhood. <laughs> now, have you guys seen the, the famous photograph of Jane and Sophia Loren yes. sitting in a restaurant? I want to say it was Ciro's, I think. And, and that, 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 that devilish side eye. Yeah, yeah. so she's, Jane's le leaning forward, her, her ample assets uh, spilling out on the table. <laughs> And you see, you see uh, Sophia Loren just kind of yeah. looking down at uh, 
that and apparently Jane was known for that that she yeah. did not hesitate to draw attention to herself and I've heard that, when yeah. she did that all cameras were on her and and, 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 I, and then all the the females around her would start look, doing that and roll, rolling their eyes and here she goes again I'd also <laughs> start like start that. hugging their husbands really hard <laughs> around the neck I'd also like to say that you know, sure, he, the guy's a schlub, but what you're saying is there's hope for the <laughs> schlubs out there. Like, for the schlubs. Yeah. And sh- the schlubs of America unite. I mean, James um, Man- James Mansfield and, 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 and Maryland. Man- and Maryland. Man, wow. All right, so that brings us to the blonde bombshells of all blonde bombshells. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this whole podcast we decided we were going to do be, uh, to coincide with this controversial movie uh, that just was released called Blonde. It's a Netflix movie. Mm-hmm. Yes, is that correct? Starring Ana de Armas. Ana de Armas, who I Cuba. loved in Knives Out. Loved her in the most recent James Bond film. I thought she almost stole the recent James Bond film. And in Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah, she, that was I haven't fr- seen that one. Oh, Joe. So um, <laughs> it's so good. Now the movie was met with controversy, which we're going to get into in a bit. Uh, before we get into the movie and uh, get your reviews from it. Let's do a little brief bio. So uh, doing some research, uh, Marilyn was born Norma Jean Mortensen on June 1st of 1926 in L.A. So she's an L.A. native. Um, Spent most of her youth in foster homes, spent some time in an orphanage. Her mother, Gladys uh, Pearl Baker, who wasn't necessarily a bad person, but she had uh, mental issues and was diagnosed uh, paranoid schizophrenic and at one point uh, was confined to a hospital and spent a good part of her adult years uh, in and out of mental institutions and hospitals. So she had a pretty tragic life. And so Marilyn was forced to stay with foster families. There was one family in particular, uh, the Goddards, who she would stay with and then leave and then come back. And uh, she was molested by the patriarch of the family, Erwin Doc Goddard, Um, and... uh, so when they, when they were going to move, the Goddard family was going to move, they wanted to take Marilyn with them, but there was some law that prevented them from taking her across state lines. So she ended up uh, getting married at 16 to 21-year-old James Doherty uh, because if she didn't and this family left the state, she was going back to the orphanage at 16 years old. So she married... James Doherty, and from everything I heard, he was a good guy. He wasn't abusive to her or anything, but it was just sort of an arranged marriage to keep right. uh, from going back. Now, some people ask, uh, well, who was Marilyn Monroe's father? They knew a lot about her mother. So there was speculation, that, and Marilyn suspected who her father was. His name was Charles Stanley Gifford, who was a co-worker with Marilyn's mom that she had an affair with in 1925, about nine months before Marilyn was born. <laughs> and uh, they confirmed that in 2022 with the DNA test. They confirmed that that was her, I heard her that, father. Yeah. Oh. Now, Marilyn tried to reach out to him. When she was at the peak of stardom, there were rumors that he had might have been her father. And when she approached him and tried to reach out to him, he wanted nothing to do with her and spurned her and said, I am not interested, which blows my mind. This this most famous actress in the world is coming to you right. for, you know, hey, I'm your daughter, and he spurns her? I, I don't get that at I, all. I, I get the feeling that he might made up his mind when Gladys was pregnant that, hey, yeah. you know, that's that. There's going to be nothing. He buried it so hard that when he was confronted with the truth, his immediate knee-jerk was, nope. Yeah. yeah. So imagine what that did psychologically to, to Marilyn, being right. spurned by the man she suspected was her father, who later was confirmed to be her father. Uh, so as far as her career goes, she uh, she was working at some factory and uh, was discovered and became a pinup model. Uh, the pinup uh, modeling gig led to uh, minor film roles. She was encouraged to go blonde. So in 1946, she walked into a little uh, salon called Frank and Joseph's Beauty Salon on Hollywood Boulevard, which you, it's the, the Frank and Joseph still exists today in a oh, wow. different location. There's something else occupying that space. But if you're on Hollywood Boulevard, you can approach the building that what? housed the salon where she became blonde. What's the, like the cross street Hollywood and it's near Wilcox and and again this is another that. this is another weird universe coincidence but when I I looked at a Google map to try and find that address and I saw that it was near Wilcox 
I recognized it immediately because Wilcox, right off of Hollywood Boulevard, is a giant mural that you see in La La Land. Um, uh, Emma Stone's character walks past this mural, and who was on the mural? Marilyn Monroe. So right around the corner from where Marilyn became blonde is a mural that has Marilyn on it. Come on, man. This is, this is eerie. So um, let's see. So, again, and this is where things kind of come full circle. When she decided to go blonde, she did so because she wanted to emulate an actress named Jean Harlow. Interesting, huh? Uh, she signed a wow. contract with Fox in 1950, and her popularity increased. Uh, then uh, her nude photos appeared in the very first issue of Playboy in 1953. She was like, fine. She had no problem with it. <laughs> Everyone was, you know, clutched their pearls and that, and it only bolstered her image. She got right. even more popular. Uh, of course, we all know she was married to Joe DiMaggio and playwright Arthur Miller. She was drawn uh, to intellectual. She was a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln. Did you guys know that? No, she I didn't know that. worshipped Abraham Lincoln. And there's a photo you can find online where she's sitting in the back of, I think it was a convertible, and she has a portrait of Abraham Lincoln clutched in her arms. Oh. Um, she loved in- intellectuals. She loved reading, loved poetry, all that stuff. She She herself was an intellectual, which I don't think a lot of people give her enough uh credit for uh so as her uh star uh you know skyrocketed uh, she did a string of films some of my favorites are gentlemen prefer blondes which i think she was at her absolute uh peak she uh, my chest hurts when i watch that movie she's just at, at her absolute peak uh, How to Marry a Millionaire, where they tried to ugly her up by making her wear glasses. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. It's a Hollywood thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you're like, uh, guys, this is having the opposite <laughs> effect. Of what... No, and, th- and that's <laughs> like when they try to make you, when they make actors younger, they give them bangs, because everyone yeah. who's young, <laughs> young people right. have bangs. Right. Yeah, it reminds me of a comic strip where a husband and wife are sitting on a couch watching TV, and the wife says, do you think she's pretty? And he goes, of course she's pretty. She's on TV. <laughs> Hollywood's <laughs> idea of an ugly girl is a pretty girl with glasses. Mm. And I think the comic strip was Arlo and Janice, and that's one of my favorite lines. That's hysterical. Uh, so How to Marry a Millionaire, she played the nerdy girl. And then we mentioned Seven Year Itch, uh, fam- uh, featuring a very famous scene, which I'm going to play right now. Didn't you just love the picture? I did. But I just felt so sorry for the creature at the end. Sorry for the creature? Why'd you want him to marry the girl? He was kind of scary looking, but he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. (laughs) Oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? Uh, one of the most famous scenes in the history of film. If you were to edit together a little uh, montage of the most famous scenes that, in America cinema, that's got to be in there. The yep. subway scene with that famous dress. Holy moly. Mm, yep. I, mean, I mean, people, you talk about scenes that have been recreated now by people who, who are fans. You know, when Titanic came out, people were, you'd have people getting on the. You know, the front of the ship and doing the whole yeah. pose thing. Being, oh, my <laughs> God. So, yeah, you can imagine that has been recreated yeah. millions of times over. Now, probably. that particular scene from what I read uh, contributed to the end of her marriage with Joe DiMaggio because he stood off camera and watched her do that scene over and over and over. Now, initially, they shot it on location in New York where a crowd had gathered, and yeah. she just had no problem standing over that subway grate letting her dress blow up. And some people said... Under the lights, it, uh, you saw more than that was intended. <laughs> so they ended up reshooting the scene in a studio, and I think what we see in the film is is on a studio set, closed right. off to the public. But as Joe DiMaggio watched everyone gawking and laughing and pointing as she let her dress fly up, uh, you know, uh, over her shoulders, Joe DiMaggio got incensed and lost his mind. So it may have played a role in the end of their marriage. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I would be elbowing people going, that's mine. That's, <laughs> she's, she's with me. So, yeah. 
Uh, so let's see. Oh, she also uh, won a Golden Globe for Some Like It Hot in 1959, which is a black and white film, which is kind of odd because she did several color films. And then later on in her career, she did Some Like It Hot, which was black and white with Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon. And she won a Golden Globe for that role. And she was great in that. And from what I read, she deliberately put on some weight because, uh, she was trying to like sabotage the film because she was playing yet another dumb blonde role. But oh, so uh, it, like a tiny act of rebellion. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> all it, it did was, uh, you know, Just, uh, psh, yeah. yeah. It, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It Boosted accented it. her curves yeah. in her assets. <laughs> uh, so she was normally popular in that film. And then her last completed film was The Misfits with Clark Gable in 1961. Uh, in Jeez, 19... Clark Gable twice now with Gene Harlow and oh, now another with... one who uh, yeah, what a renaissance yeah. man huh yeah and he was <laughs> he was married to um, oh darn it I'm I'm drawing a blank she she she's the one who died in a plane crash it'll come to me later but yeah he's he's been connected to some of the most beautiful women in, in Hollywood and he wasn't so bad looking himself and their final films uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Carol Lombard is the name I was trying okay. to think of he was actually married to her so. Um, so, in 1962, she began work on a film called Something's Gotta Give, which, again, another weird little universe thing that that would have been her final film, uh, co-starring Dean Martin. Now, a lot of that film survived. They shot, I think, maybe 50, 60 percent of that film um, before they shut down production on it because she was always sick and missing work and holding up production and everyone was losing their mind and she was costing the studio's money. Uh, but they shot quite a bit of it, and uh, and I found out just a few years ago that someone took what was shot and edited it together to give us an idea of what the film might have been like, and it was fantastic, and it would have been a huge, huge hit for Marilyn had she completed it. Right. Wow. Um, but, yeah, and, and the, the basic premise is she's married to Dean Martin. She flies a, uh, to a conference or something, the plane is presumed to have gone down and lost at sea. Uh, she's missing. They, uh, the courts rule her dead. He ends up remarrying, and she shows up. And uh, he's like, oh, no, I have a new life now. And it's a really, really good movie. And if you want to get an idea of, of what the movie might have been like completed, they ended up recasting it uh, with Doris Day and James Garner and called it Move Over, Darling. So if you ever watch uh, that film, you'll I get just, a sense of like the tale. And I the did not know that away. story. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Tom Hanks like coming back. back. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You're exactly right about that. Yeah. Um, so she was filming that movie uh, during production of that when she was missing a lot of work and causing production delays to the horror of the studio. She showed up on May 19th to sing happy birthday to JFK at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> so imagine, the you know, the studio is like, yeah, poor Marilyn, she's sick, let's give her some time. And then they see her singing to JFK. And that's the infamous, happy birthday. Yeah. I, should, I shouldn't be singing that. I should have that yeah. clip standing by. But uh, So that, like, incensed the, the, uh, the studios. They lost their freaking mind. So they, they uh, threatened the sewer. They shut down production. It was a big disaster. And... Uh, and they were going to recast it, but Dean Martin is like, no, I, I signed on to do a Marilyn Monroe movie. I'm not going to recast it. So they tried suing him. Uh, it was a big mess. And eventually, as they turned on her, they were portrayed as the villain, and they began to realize that quickly. So yeah, you're not going to win that fight. Yeah. So they started uh, negotiating with Marilyn, uh, coming up with terms that would allow her to return and finish production uh, in June. Uh, they had come to an agreement. They talked about future projects. Here's another one. Some of the future projects that uh, were on her slate was a possible biopic of Gene Harlow. Oh, boy. Isn't that weird? Now, Gene Harlow died at 26, and at this point, Marilyn was in her 30s. So there's a little bit of an age difference there. But imagine had she lived, she would have played uh, the story of Gene Harlow, which wow. is another really weird coincidence. Um, so as things were turning around and looked like uh, production was going to pick back up, uh, housekeeper Eunice Murray was staying at Marilyn's house on 5th Helena Drive in Brentwood area of L.A., which I have visited. I haven't like been inside the house, but you can kind of walk up to the gate and stick your head over the gate. Uh, the, the, le when I was there in 2005, the owners had put up a black tarp like, hey, what are you looking at? It's like, it's Marilyn Monroe's house. Yeah. Um, but I did get some pictures and peeked over the top of the gate there. 
um, knowing that was uh, where she lived. Uh, at 3 a.m. on August 5th, the morning of August 5th, she saw a light coming from under Marilyn's bedroom door, and it concerned her. And when she went to turn the knob of the door, it was locked. Uh, so she got on the phone, called Marilyn's psychiatrist, uh, Ralph Greenson. He tried to get in the bedroom. He couldn't. He went around outside the house, broke a window, uh, and found Marilyn dead in her bed. Uh, she was officially pronounced dead at 425, even though they suspect that uh, she had died the previous night. Uh, they contacted the LO, uh, LAPD, and uh, she was 36 years old. Uh, so the autopsy says that she more than likely died between 8.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on August 4th. A toxicology report showed the cause of death as acute barbiturate poisoning. Uh, empty medicine bottles were found on the nightstand. Um, now, one thing they find... Uh, perplexing is that they said the dosages that they found in her system were several times the lethal limit. So you want to think, well, maybe it was an accident, but several times the lethal limit. Uh, it's very suspicious. Uh, officially, it's ruled a suicide. Of course, many, right. many people yeah. disagree with that. Uh, she's entombed at uh, Westwood Village Memorial um, cemetery park cemetery i visited her gravesite many many times uh, one time when i visited to my shock the little vase on her wall crypt was empty no flowers hmm. and so i walked to the nearest grocery store <laughs> found a bouquet of red roses that she loved came back and put red roses in her vase and like a scene in a movie people came from all over gathered around I was sitting on a bench looking at a film clip of her singing Diamonds, Our Girl's Best Friend. Everyone turned and looked at me and said, did you put these here? And I said, well, yeah, it was empty. I didn't want to see it empty. People started taking pictures. It was a really amazing moment. Yeah, that's it was, pretty cool. It was pretty neat. Very cool. Um, so there are pictures out there of Marilyn's grave with my roses in it, which is pretty <laughs> neat. Cool. Uh, so she's in Crypt 24 in the Corridor of Memories. Uh, actor Peter Lawford was supposedly the last person to speak to her by phone. Um, supposedly, the last thing she said to Peter was, say goodbye to Pat, which I believe is his wife, say goodbye to Jack, who was JFK, and say goodbye to yourself because you're such a nice guy. Click. And that was it. Um, so that brings us to the theories, the movie, the uh, I've been doing a lot of talking, so I'm going to sort of turn it over to you guys. Uh, I couldn't bring myself to watch this new movie because uh, leading up to it, I heard really horrific reviews, and people who knew her and were close to her uh, said this is a, a piece of garbage. And the filmmakers admit that it's a work of fiction. Do not think for a moment that Blonde is an accurate portrayal of Marilyn's life. No. The director... Even the director insists this is not a Marilyn biography. It is a movie based on the book. Imagine those, Pete. What's the name of the book and who's the author? It's uh, uh, Joyce Carol Oates was the author, and it's named Blonde. And it came out in 2000. 2000 and at yeah. the time, it caused controversy because right. it was not historically accurate. Why they would choose to do a movie based on a book that is known to not be historically accurate Maybe they're just looking for controversy. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I boycotted the film. I don't see me watching it. I, a friend of mine tried watching. He said he turned it off. So you did your homework for this podcast. Yes. You sat through this movie. What is uh, your take on the movie Blonde? My Look, my official take is that it was difficult to get through because I'll be perfectly honest, I, I have very superficial knowledge of Marilyn Monroe, which is fine. You know, the, I think I've, I've mentioned like the basics: her name, Norma Jean, the, the affairs that she had, the people she was married to, the circumstances around her death, some of her um, uh, highlights of her career. So when I was watching this, I said, "Okay, it's an adaptation. I get it." Uh, for me, I always focus on story. Like, what what story are you trying to tell? Mm -hmm. and then, okay, the jumps, the time jumps in the story felt a little weird. Weird in the fact that, because it, it focused, I think, I, I remember this, it, they spent about 18 minutes on her, uh, her childhood, talking about her mother's mental illness. But what you mentioned, as far as what's public record regarding her mom's mental illness, 
got really hyped up. Again, adaptation, so you get a creative license to do whatever. In this one, her mom tries tries to drown her in the tub as an eight-year-old. Mm-hmm. And, she, you know, she gets up running, you know, to the neighbors and says, Mom, something's wrong with Mom, and there's a fire motif going around there. And it starts off very much about her father. She wants to know who her father is. That's the theme that goes throughout the entire, in fact, it ends the movie. Hmm. It, they kind of bookend the movie like that. Like it, Her mom says, yeah, that's your, there's a picture of your father. And it's like, I mean, the guy has like a white fedora hat and like it has that old classic uh, Hollywood thing. It's like Mustache. Yeah, the mustache. Hmm. And it's like, you know, I, you know, I work with your father. He's a very big man. He lives on top of the, you know, in, in the Hollywood Hills and. He's going to come for us one day. He promised he would. And, you know, so you could see her mom spiraling very early, like, oh, boy, this is not going to end well. And then so then when that happens, the neighbors take her in and then the neighbors realize they can't help her. They can't take care of her. So they dump her off at an orphanage. From there, they jump right into you know, it's like a quick montage, like pinup model. Yep. Next, thing you know, it's blonde Marilyn. Yep. And the first scene, one of the first scenes we get is she get pretty much gets uh raped by was it uh, the guy at RKO the the president at RKO she oh, goes in for geez. a reading really and, yeah, yeah you throw pulling down her her panties yeah. and then there's a oh no there's a a sex scene implied sex scene that's not gratuitous but it's like oh wow she came in there for a reading the guy doesn't care hmm. like uh you def- they definitely highlighted how men looked at her with like that wolf's eyes like yeah. Yeah. the infinite yeah. the, the subway scene where they kind of do the you see Joe DiMaggio standing there he's the only one not going yeah, <laughs> like yeah, every yeah. guy looks like like oh wow. I mean, I think we're like overselling the all that you basically didn't show them was what were they doing with their hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's basically what they said because they film all these guys from the chest up, all going yeah. yeah. They, you know, they, like, okay, and just Joe Jamaica going. Uh, she's doing they, this. They look like uh, the wolves from like a Looney Tunes yeah. commercial with their eyes popping out. And they're just, ah, yeah. <laughs> like this, I'm like okay, you want to sell? That's why. So when you were telling me about that part, I'm like okay, they captured some. They were going for the. So story wise, I felt the the time jumps were a bit off. Um, I didn't really understand the style they were going for. I, I don't care about black and white. I enjoy black and white movies. But for instance, the um, was the whole thing black and white? No, no, no. no, it, no they'll be they're, yeah, it drift between black and white and color. Gotcha. So for instance, she she gets. I didn't know about her having a uh, polyamorous relationship with uh, Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Edward G. Robinson Jr. No, let me stop you there. <laughs> Apparently, that was a big thing. So, right? no. fa- fact check us, baby. Yeah, fact check I, I did a little Googling fact versus fiction, and that is a work of fiction. That, okay. that did not happen. 100%. Um, I know. She may have been connected to Chaplin Jr., um, but as far as uh, Edward Robinson, he play, they may not have ever met in real life. Okay. That, I, why they created that love triangle thing there, and I it was don't strange. know. Um, but yeah, so that is a uh, from what I read, pure work of fiction. She, got, in the pre- book. she gets impregnated by uh, Charlie Chaplin Jr. and then she says, "You know, I, I don't know if I should have the baby because maybe he inherited the mental illness that my mom had. I don't mm-hmm. know, so I'm going to get the abortion." And then she decides not to get the abortion, but the car driver won't listen to her. She she had this coming to Jesus moment. She says, "No, I want to keep the kid," and no one's going to listen to her. So on the car ride over, she's like, can you please stop the car? I want to change my mind. Nope. She's in the stirrups. I want to change my mind. Nope. Mm. They inject her with the anesthetic. Mm. And then she says, I, I don't want to lose it. And then she gets off. She jumps off the stirrups and goes running around. But that's the hallucination. That's what she wanted to have done. Mm. But the drugs had taken effect. So she had the abortion because also the studio was saying, hey, you don't want to be palling around with mm. Charlie Chaplin Jr. Edwin G. Yeah. Robin. These guys are just. Yeah. Party animals. You don't do that to yourself. Now, let me interject here. Uh, again, I did some reading on this, and I didn't know about that going into this as I was researching it. Uh, there is absolutely zero evidence that she ever had an abortion. Uh, she did have two miscarriages and a, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, an ectopic, ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, pregnancy. Ectopic. Yeah. Yep. And there's documented history of her trying to get pregnant failing and it had a severe impact on her she desperately wanted to be a yes. mother um but that part they they showed in the, in yeah, the movies and but there's zero evidence that she ever had but i think abortion. the stress of her lifestyle and everything and, and just the stress stress is very major in a, in a pregnancy and it yeah. can affect a pregnancy a great deal so that's not at all that surprising but the, some of the some of the cinematography like you would see the speculum go in to her vagina. Yeah. Oh, really? Like they had an angle shot. Was that graphic? Yeah, you showed like from the vagina kind, perspective. Kind, yeah, the, kind the, of. What? I mean, it, it doesn't actually show the 
It's from the perspective of the as inside yeah. of if the... If you were inside yeah. the vagina and the, as the... That's the, insane And it was, it's me. about a... Two, it's like a half a second yeah. to maybe a second, it's, but... It's a, it's just... But I was yeah. like, why would you do that? Like, what was the... What was the that sounds art? like something Sam Raimi would do. He would always yes. shoot weird things from the perspective of an inanimate object or whatever. There's lots of camera play in this movie. Oh, yes. Wow. They, they, there was a lot of camera play... Uh, techniques and like I said, for it, uh, if you were a cinematographer, you probably enjoyed it because that you saw a lot of techniques that probably different people who had formal mm. education. So I'm I'm all for that. I got to ask you about one thing. Uh, uh, sort of an acquaintance of mine, we're Facebook friends, and I've met her a couple of times. Uh, big Hollywood person uh, trying to protect the history of Hollywood. She got to see a sneak peek of the movie. They projected it in the theater, and she was horribly offended by it. And she said. She said, "A uh, little too much uh, talking fetus for my taste." Can can you expand on that? I don't know what. It, can you enlighten me? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Andrew. You, I'll, um, I'm this. pretty pretty much all. I think pretty uh, all three pregnancy pregnancies. You know, show like a three uh, a CGI rendering of a of a yeah. A, you know, a whatever fetus inside in Say, the womb, six week old baby. You don't see the mouth moving unless I miss that. No. But, but it, you know, it shows a close-up of the baby, and it's a kid's voice communicating with Marilyn. It's wow. It's something else. Yeah, I went – I was like, what, yeah. what is the purpose of this? I, I, I I'm, mean, like, sitting here dumbfounded and almost sickened as I'm well, hearing these descriptions. And, and for me, here's the thing. If you're telling an adaptation, I, I, so, okay, I never read the book, so I'm not going to say it's like, I don't understand the story. If it's an adaptation of the book, if this is what the book was talking about, then great. If it's a 100% adapta- faithful adaptation of the book, which was, you know, w- say what you want about it, then fine. But when I watched the movie, I said, okay, so are we focusing on this part of our life, that part of our life? Like, we just keep jumping around from, are you, are you just trying to paint that from childhood to her death? It's the longing for the father. Yes, Okay. That's the common denominator. Right. Yeah. Oh, I get it. And you're looking for the, She calls Joe DiMaggio daddy all the time. Uh, oh, yeah. She calls every guy yeah. in every scene. Well, she had a hit song, My Heart Belongs to Daddy. Yeah. 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 The, every scene with a man. Daddy? Yeah. Is that wow. you? With eyes, there, you know, uh, this big. It's, yeah. Because she... Wow. Remember yeah. the, 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 the letter she got? Uh, there's, a letter, there's a scene where she gets a letter saying as if her father wants to meet her. Oh, finally, yeah. want to reconnect with her. Turns out that... She go after the premiere of uh, which uh, I forgot which movie it was. Um, was it Niagara? N- or, no, no, no. Um, was it James Dean's East later? of Eden, or I know she attended that one. This was in 1952. No. Um, yeah, I can't remember which. Anyway, I'm sorry, but it, it's it, she's in the theater. She's waiting. She's waiting for the movie to be done because she knows there's a surprise waiting for you at the hotel room afterwards in the after party. Uh, yeah. She gets up. She's like, okay, yeah, thanks everybody, and she goes there, opens it thinking her father's going to be there because that's what it was implied for. It's Joe DiMaggio waiting to propose to her. Hmm. And he proposes, and she's like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess. So maybe she wasn't that big into the marriage with Joe DiMaggio. But the way – first of all, Anna DeMarmis, great performer. If she mm-hmm. was going for her mm-hmm. Oscar nod, uh, she's going to get her Oscar nod. I, maybe. I, I predict. I really? predict. I, I, I predict uh, – I'd be surprised. Seven or eight Oscar noms for this movie. If she doesn't get a nomination, I'd be surprised. Let's put it that way. Yes. I don't know if she'll win, but yes. I'll be surprised if she doesn't get a nomination. Because yeah. you, you can you can say what you want about the film, but the performance, you do what you can with the material given to you. Now, yep. since you're you're talking about Joe DiMaggio, I'm curious if this yeah. real life scene made it into the film. So what I had read, one of the things that intrigued Marilyn about Joe DiMaggio is they were having dinner together, you know, on a date. Yes. And when people approached the table, she was like, oh, geez, here we go. And they were like, Mr. DiMaggio, can we have your autograph? And she was like, what? That he was more famous than her, and that intrigued her. Was that depicted in the film at all? Not not so much. They talk about fame. Like, he's just, in fact, he just appears in the movie. Yeah. Hmm. Out of, it's, seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah, it's just like on one day she's yeah. she having, and, and it just says in the captions, <laughs> Joe DiMaggio. It's like, oh, <laughs> okay, thank you for telling us who this character is because I was just wondering who's this random dude she's having dinner with. Wow. Bob, Bob, by Bobby Cannavale. Yeah. Great huh. actor. And yeah, yeah. Great performance. And yeah, so, yeah. And he, says, mm. and he says, oh, so you're based, and, and they never show anyone approaching them, but he, they have this coming, this meeting of the minds where he says, I understand what fame is like and what it's like oh, to sure. be under the microscope. I'm Joe DiMaggio. Yeah, New York. That's what I think bonded them. Right, and so the, the weird thing was, is DiMaggio when he when he married her expected her to step away from all that, yes. and, she was and like, he wanted because and, and and they yeah. ooh, 
Yeah. There's there's a good. Yeah, they, they go into that good. <laughs> they emphasize because she says, I, I love children. She's like, okay, she wants to be a fan. Let, let's go to New York. They moved to New York. Yeah. And then once you get there, like, they paint Joe DiMaggio's family, extended family. Like, they do, they're they looking at uh, Marilyn Monroe and like, who's this trash you brought in? Like, she doesn't uh, yeah, get anything. Yeah, it's, it's kind of arrogant. And hmm. yeah. uh, remember, she's sitting in the living room yeah. talking with a, a couple women. And they, what do they say? Is your hair real? Yeah. It's and, like, and she's like, no. And they like laugh at her, like. So you get oh, the thing that yeah. she's being cool. is- isolated, and then Joe DiMaggio's sitting there, like in his wife beater, yeah, just yeah. watching the game and like kind of like eyeballing and seeing how. Oh, does she get along with my family? Like Joe, your family, not you, not you, Joe, but DiMaggio, <laughs> your family. <laughs> no, I got that. Yeah, your family stinks. <coughs> and then he kind of gets you see the you know like, do you want to be treated like a piece of meat? Because, and the- that's that seemed to be a common theme in her life was, and I saw that phrase many times as yeah. I did my research. She didn't want to be treated like a piece of meat. She was passed around right. like a piece of meat. Yes. Mm-hmm. Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Ed- Edward G. Robinson make a, a, a reappearance. They go. They apparently contact Joe DiMaggio and show him pictures of her, her topless pictures. Yeah. Her pinup stuff and says, this is what she, almost like. Like they're trying to. Blackmail? Yeah. Or just Like say, hey, so, we got, you know, don't screw with us. Mm. Yeah, or because they were just upset that he married, she got married to him. Right? Yeah. Instead of breaking their little trinity yeah, yeah and so he gets incensed he and he gets those pictures they the camera focuses on him walking in it's almost like it's a gopro on his face on one of those cinematography techniques yeah. that i yeah they had the don't camera con- connected to yeah so he's running up the stairs he's in a rage he comes in she's re- rehearsing lines or something just reading a script and he just comes and he smacks her yeah and then she's like i don't understand and then he says you want to be treated like a piece of me then you should i, I only hit you because i love you yeah kind of thing that old line yeah. and then they yeah. do the subway scene the the, uh, the shot and, and that was the final straw and then you see him he comes back at that night and then he just kind of like throws her you see, it gets a little bit violent but then the violence moves off camera yeah, and you hear it and then the camera zooms in uh you you see the set set shaking a little yeah. bit you hear her screaming so huh. it's it's at, at one very, point it almost raw. it almost yeah. implied because you don't see it, but you based on what you hear it almost implied the first time i heard it was like oh then he must have like forced himself on her yeah because like do you want to be treated like a piece of me then fine yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like oh wow okay yeah and then after that it cuts to she goes to an acting it, it's black and white again and she goes to a, a, a you know thing to practice a craft for like theater and that's when she runs into miller yeah and uh, they have the intellectual lines. and then yeah, you, yeah. you and you see a- there you, adrian brody yeah adrian another brody. Stellar role. Adrian huh. Boyd, yeah, he did a yeah. great job portraying it. And then he, you know, it's like they have this conversation, and you kind of see that people often underestimated her intelligence and her, the way yes. she could study a role and, you know, play the character. And so he kind of recognized that and goes, oh, wow, I'm learning stuff about Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. And this is about with an hour left in the movie. Yeah. So, yeah, it's starting to get into the third act, yeah. I think. Yeah. Around, around there. Yeah. And then. Yeah, you know, Andrew will go in the morning with some of the other stuff, but then for me the JFK stuff stood oh. out. That was like I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. The secret so <laughs> I don't want this to go too long because I want Andrew. <laughs> Cliff notes, Secret Service show up, they take her to the president, he forces her to perform oral sex. Yeah. And then he rapes her. Hmm. Now and, let me let me interject at that because uh, part of the theme here is I want to do truth versus uh fiction here. Yes. Um there, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. There was an auction a few years ago for a roll of film. Uh, did you guys hear about this? <laughs> I think we've talked about this off. off Supposedly, yes. off JFK would film <laughs> with a hidden camera his his uh, uh, dalliances. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> his indiscretions. And apparently, this film has Marilyn performing oral sex on JFK. The winner of the auction vowed to never let the public see it. Now, he didn't destroy it. That would be stupid. <laughs> but he has it in a vault somewhere where people are never going to see it. Now, so there's confirmation that, obviously, they had their relationship. Yep. But right. one of those truth versus fiction things that I read said he never, ever forced himself on her. Um, so that's a bit of a fabrication for the film as well. Yeah, and then, you know, and then she was – loaded up with drugs so she kind of pukes all over his his beds and then you, you kind of see like oh this is the start of, they're hinting at this is the start yeah. of the drugs and alcohol that's where that's where the sp- the spiral the, the movie starts spiraling yeah. downward mm-hmm. and the filming the edits the way yeah. she starts acting 
Anyway, I'm not gonna. No, no, let me. Going. Know, we're going to begin to because <laughs> yeah. where she starts getting and, boisterous and she can't really make the the, the scenes. You know, the, yeah, the student's yeah. like, "Hey, what's going on with you?" And then yeah. you know, uh, her her husband's like, "You know, I'm I'm done with this. Yeah, I I can't handle this. Yeah." And so this this she's abandoned. She's alone, alone. Nothing but the drugs left. She's yeah. always gonna be seen as Marilyn, not Norma Jean. And Marilyn's life is, I, so I get the themes they were going for. It was just, but the story, I. I was like, I didn't know where we were going with the story. Right. You know, if I, if, if I had to read the book to figure out, this would have been, you know. Yeah. Now, Andrew, we have about 15 minutes left on the podcast. Um, yeah. I want you to chime in with, uh, did they, did the movie take a position on what caused her death? And I want both of you to chime in with what your theory is. So, Andrew, what did they suggest was the cause of death? <laughs> Maybe one of the least explicit things about yeah. the movie is they don't they show they show her in bed with you know open pill bottles, but d- Nick, did you notice all the authority figures that surround her towards the end, like the cops taking her into the hospital? I kind of get the feeling that this was like a top down situation, like maybe government or hmm. yeah mafia connections, but it's not explicit. Yeah, um, so they leave it up to the viewer. They kind of huh? glo- yeah. yeah. It seems like after all the statements they made throughout the film, it that seems like the- that was gutless to not at least make some it, sort of accusation. They just went right along with the barbiturate. Like she hmm. kind of passes away. She has the scene where she's welcomed into the afterlife yeah. by her it's her it's dad. Uh, hmm. it's very ambiguous. Yeah. yeah. Um, the camera ling- like the final scene. The camera lingers on her, <laughs> her feet dangling off the bed, and you hear the out like everyday life yep. going on outside. Yeah. 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 Yep. So I'm curious, do you do each of you have a theory? Andrew, what's your theory? Do you do you know enough of the details to postulate a theory or are you just gonna go with the uh official record? I I I can't I can't say with certainty that I, I would point to. I mean, so far I, I just think it was an overdose caused by compounding effects of everything we know about her biography. Mm-hmm. Just based on fact. Yeah. And that she had attempted suicide earlier in her life too. I think there were several attempts that may, may or may not have been half-hearted. But yeah, yeah, I I am less inclined to go with the barbiturate standard overdose thing because she was struggling. She she was struggling, but there is there is a there's a strength about her that would go yeah. that that you know isn't really focused on, and the fact that. The connections that she had, I'm not talking about just the Rat Pack. I'm talking about politically. You talk about oh, Robert sure. Kennedy. Yeah, Bobby, uh, you know, yeah, and, Jack, yeah. yeah. And especially the timing in this. So it was it, it was strange that that part of the film got the leap. They were like, oh, this part we're just going to like kind of coast in and yeah. let it be after all the other stuff we showed for the first two hours and two and a half hours. <laughs> Now, one thing that doesn't jibe with the suicide theory is that, uh, you know, I mentioned in my little brief biography that she, things seem to be turning around at this yes. point in her life, and she and she was going to resume production of the film. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend to know what's going on inside of the mind of a suicidal person, right. but it sure sounded like there wasn't a motivation, unless you factor in the Kennedy connection. So let's yes. let's delve into that first. That, I would think, had to play a role, because that part, in, despite what they show in the film, in real life, when you... Have an affair. I mean, look, I'm not saying anything happened to her, but you look at what happened to Monica Lewinsky's life. Oh, yeah, they tore her up. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and so you can imagine Marilyn Monroe. Monica Lewinsky was an unknown intern at the time. <laughs> yeah. you know, not one of the biggest Hollywood stars yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. for, for a, a, a decade. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, um, what I had read, and again, you could, you could put weight behind this if you want or not, but what I had read is, you know, she had pursued. JFK hoping she was going to swoop in and become the first lady of the United States. He used her. He rejected her. She moved on to Bobby, had a fling with Bobby. He rebuffed her. Um, Now she was threatening to expose this Kennedy family. And that was not a wise decision. No, Joe Kennedy senior was very protective and that's mm-hmm. that's not even Hollywood speculation. Oh that's yeah, just, he yeah, was, yeah, yeah. He was historical. He was cutthroat. Big yeah. yeah, yeah. So so she had threatened uh, to go public. Now what I had read was when she got on good terms with the movie studio, she wanted to call a um, 
uh, press conference to announce that things were going to be progressing on the film. Well, when people heard that Marilyn was calling a press conference, they assumed the worst. And from what I understand, that press conference never happened because she died before it could take place. Oh. People thought that that press conference was being called, that she was going to expose the, oh. the, the uh, clan there. Now, uh, the weekend prior to her death, she was called, uh, invited out to Sinatra's, what do they call it, the Cal Neva Lodge, which I assume stands for uh, California, Nevada. Hmm. She was in, invited to that lodge. They said when she showed up, she was in good spirits. Uh, soon she became started slurring her speech. Uh, Sinatra was really, really worried that she was going to say something stupid and uh, – had uh, was kind of escorted out of the party. But one thing I did read, it, she had a diary, and, and supposedly Bobby Kennedy was desperately searching for this diary. But one of the excerpts that I had heard uh, was in this diary was at that party, uh, she was unconscious for a, a period, and in her diary she wrote, I don't know what happened. Did I have sex? I'm not quite sure what happened. The witnesses <clears throat> claim that she... She was invited to that party because mob boss, uh, I think his name was Sam Giancana, uh, told Sinatra, I want to get with this Marilyn Monroe chick. He, Sinatra invited her over. They drugged her up. She passed yeah. out. They took turns with her. Yeah. She wakes up not knowing what had happened, is escorted from the party. Um, that was the weekend before her death. Now, one of the theories out there, witnesses claim that they heard yelling in the house the, the day of the preceding discovery of her body. They said there was an ambulance outside earlier in the day. Like, there were all these weird things that were happening. And there's a theory out there that um, both Bobby Kennedy and uh, Peter Lawford were at the house uh, the, the, the day before her body was found. And there's a theory that Bobby Kennedy may have played a death or played a role in the death. Now he denied being in LA, but a lot of witnesses place him at Peter Lawford's Malibu beach house, uh, yeah, at the time you, of her you death. You can't say that. You so, can't say I wasn't even in, in Los Angeles. Like, dude, come on. Yeah. So there's a theory that, uh, Bobby and some, uh, uh, secret service arrived at the house. Lawford was there. They searched a house. Uh, Marilyn got really angry. There were shouts, which witnesses corroborate. Um, so he supposedly gave her uh, a drink to calm her down, and Peter Lawford uh, told a confidant that he watched her slip away after she had taken this drink. And uh, he, they said it affected him the rest of his life. Sinatra took her death really, really hard. He felt maybe he played a role in it. I don't know. Um, so there's lots of theories, lots of speculation, but it is ugly, ugly, ugly any yeah. way you look at it. Yeah. Wasn't there a thing that, were you the one that told me that uh, Joe DiMaggio came to be a pallbearer for her? I believe so, yeah. and, and I think he had uh, flowers delivered to her yeah. grave like every day for years. Uh. Um, so he still pined for her. And um, so initially my theory was that it was an accidental overdose because that happens a lot with celebrities where they're over prescribed by various doctors and that was right. my theory for the longest time but as i read more and more about this it, it sure sounds like the timing of it all and her threats to expose the kennedy clan make this far more complicated than uh what and we are led to believe just don't add any um any reason to doubt the story so for something like for like robert kennedy yeah, okay, I was in Los Angeles. So yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> it's Los Angeles. I'm Robert Kennedy. I'm yeah. visiting friends. Okay, so what? I'm in the city, so therefore I did it. Yeah. You know, like lean into it. Why would you say <laughs> I was never I was never in that city? Robert, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you gotta have some plausible deniability. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, now that just says, okay, wh why would you lie about that, Robert? That's just weird. Yeah. Did did we ever find out if uh, Sirhan Sirhan was a uh, Patsy, I'm, I'm, no, uh, I'm a Maryland fan, and maybe he kind of got his revenge. No, he, I don't <laughs> know the details of that. You know that that that's a good one for our future podcast. We're going to talk right. about some political, political intrigue, so let's save that one yeah. for there. But I don't think there was a Maryland connection there. But that's <laughs> that's a great topic for a future episode. But I'll tell you what: after this, uh, when we leave here, I am going to go check out. There is another Maryland documentary that showed up on. I think I was telling you guys on HBO Max. Yes. So that coincidentally happened to sh show up right around the same time as this was being released. So you know, I don't know if this is a little streaming platform crossfire here, but 
Sure. So now this way I can go and you know do a little research because I'm 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 it's kind of curious uh, the nature of a death. Yeah, look, it's tragic. It, right, the, the public story is yeah an overdose and yeah. Now um, those young people who might not be all that familiar with Marilyn, uh, I beg you, avoid this movie. Because uh, you don't want that memory in your brain. Watch Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Watch How to Marry a Millionaire. Watch Seven Year Itch. Oh, how about this? I'll put it this at way. At her peak. I don't think you should be afraid of stuff. What I would say is do your homework first. Yes. Read about Marilyn. Yeah. Read, go go get a bunch of sources that you know are fictional. I mean, uh, uh, non-fictional. Yeah, yeah. Build your base of knowledge of Marilyn and then go watch something. And there's some great books out there. I have yeah. a book that has like replica artifacts from her life. Uh, notes, handwritten notes, and little trinkets and stuff. And, uh, you know, she she wasn't just despondent her whole life. She was vibrant. She was a beautiful person. She smiled. Everyone wants to paint this portrait of this tragic uh, person, but uh, she she lived a life. She lived a lot of life in her short 36 years or whatever. Yeah. I will say this. for, for the, in, When it comes to um, the medical studies regarding suicide, is that when people going through depression start to recover, if there's an upward trend, that's when you're the most concerned about them. Hmm. Only because... Yeah, that manic... Well, yeah, yeah, not yeah. only that, because when they're feeling good and everything's go- finally gone right, they've been low. They never want to go back down there again. So they right. feel like, well, I'm, well, the going's good, I'm going to get out. Like yeah, That's yeah. what studies have kind of shown. That Why would they... Because people say, I don't understand. Their life was Man. turning around opportunities this was happening that was happening people should they love them said okay I, i'm good i never want to feel that low yeah. and i might yeah, go lower yeah. so mm-hmm. i'm going to leave so that's why they always say watch them then so but i'm not going to say a whole lot more about the movie but i hope you don't uh fire me from the <laughs> podcast show yeah. but i i i do have reservations about the movie but i I wouldn't give it a forty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes like a lot of people have. Yeah, I th- I think a, about a half hour could have been cut out of it. Oh well, yeah, oh yeah. The, so about, hey, it's a two hour forty seven minute movie. The, the uh, if I were to, if I were to write the screenplay or direct it, I would cut back on the explicit stuff. Yeah. Um, I would yeah. not shoot for an NC seventeen. Um. Yeah. The, that being said. Yeah. On a technical level, this movie is. It's something else. The huh. acting is great. The cinematography is beautiful. The editing, going back and forth, uh, like it's one seamless shot following Marilyn and then turning into a room, and then there's a, the room's on fire. Hmm. It's it, it's kind of like a dream. It's like a David Lynch movie, yeah. which, jo- Joe, I, I know you you don't like it, but it's, it's very it's, artistic. Uh, um, one thing I, I, I noticed, and I think I might be right about this, I haven't read, but the scenes that are in black and white are meant to be fictional from Marilyn's point of view. The mm. scenes that are in color are meant to be yeah. slightly more factual. Mm. And it's a stream of consciousness movie. That that's the thing. Um it it you have to go scene by scene. You can't mm. So it's it's I it, feel I feel like we're yeah. I feel like we're we're defending You have to go into it with an open mind. I I feel like we're defending a Detroit Lions performance. Yeah. Here. Like, <laughs> well, if they didn't do this this and this they would have won the game but they had a great offense and blah blah blah, yeah. you know. Well, it's like you can, you can you can point there are, there are some there are absolutely some positive things about it, the movie regarding performances, cinematography, editing. There but, yeah, there are a few sparks where you yeah. can see see her brighten up and and joke with her makeup artist or hair des- yeah. designer and the 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 Fifteen minutes or so that she's with Arthur Miller and is happy, that's the most beautiful part, yeah. in my opinion, of the movie because it's very colorful. She seems genuinely happy. Yeah, she she kind of takes a a backseat and not calling him daddy every time. Yeah, um, it's like islands of joy. Yes, and like the sea of misery. Yeah, so the, you... there is a small, slight connective tissue, and I hear the talking off mu- music, but. <laughs> Joe. I'm going to take your word for it. Uh, yes. I, I don't want that to be my memory of Marilyn. I, I, I have the books. I have the photos. I have the movies. That's yes. my Marilyn. I'm sticking to it. Yes. Um, guys, i got to say, it's probably one of my favorite episodes of our podcast we've done so yeah. far. Same here. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thanks for your contribution. Thanks for taking the bullet, watching the movie. <laughs> for me. And uh, thank you for listening. And we yes. will see you again on an upcoming episode of... Hollywood Crime Scene. Oh. Yep.